Greetings all. Last Outrider here with a special 30th anniversary for 40k. I shall be taking you back to the beginning on multiple levels. But I won't tell you how because, well, if you care enough, you'll search it on your own. I shall start with a reading. As Lexandro sat caged and almost stupefied in the humming iron chair, his naked body suffered intermittent shocks and needle pricks, while spinning flashing lights disoriented his vision. He distantly heard the reports of the tech. Muscular potential, 0.87. Drug readings. Nil on blitz, or stem, or frenzy. Nil on spook. Nil on dream bat addiction. Routine traces of halcyon and hedonic acid and joy spike. Psychosis level, 0.42. Psychic profile, 0.01. Ocular reflex, intelligence, Ballistic skill, pain tolerance. Agony flashed through Lexandro momentarily, as if molten iron from a smelter had been diverted through his veins and his intestines. Perhaps he shrieked aloud, but the terrible instant was already past. Eventually, the grill swung away from the iron chair and the helmet from his head. Releasing Lexandro. Yet he did not rise, for a giant loomed over him. Lexandro de Arcubus demanded the possessor of that extraordinary physique. What is the name of the Emperor? I I don't know, sir, Lexandro stuttered. And for once, the title of Sir had come sincerely to his lips. He gritted his teeth, angry at his tongue for having tripped him. He had never stuttered before, neither during his humiliation initiation into the lordly phantasms, nor on any subsequent hazardous escapade with them, nor even when the de Arquebus's family was demoted. However, this was different. Goosebumps popped his bare flesh. He felt genuine awe at this superhuman man. At once, so puissant, so self-possessed, so monomaniac <laughs> in his demeanor, how could he answer? Surely no one knew the name of the distant, immortal lord of mankind, in whom Lexandro had only ever felt the most casual interest since his early catechisms. Awesome. Awesome is his name, sir, he suggested. And the giant almost smiled. So... I am your emperor here, it seems. True enough, in his name, I can crush you or increase you. Think carefully. Would you become a space marine in his service? Alexandro quailed, surveying the physique before him. How could I possibly match you, sir? Oh, that is not a problem. You are not yet too old. Your body still grows. We shall assist it to grow and assist you to grow as a human being. Alexandro didn't understand. He imagined bone-wrenching exercises and an accelerated real food diet 
such as had been distant, distinctly lacking since his father's shaming. Whenever he had happened to notice devotional vids, he presumed that the Space Marines recruited exceptional adult fighters, not, he swallowed pride, not boys. Is this a cruel joke, he asked. All hint of the smile vanished. The giant cuffed him across the side of his head. Only lightly so. Yet, Alexandro's teeth rattled, and the iron chair rocked. I guess not, he gasped. But how, sir? Strangers are listening, was the giant's only answer to that. And Alexandro's spirit swelled as he conceived hazily of an initiation rite far beyond that of any Necromundian gang, and infinitely more potent. I think you understand, said the giant. Would you forsake your family, and your hive, and your world, to be sent wherever the Imperium wishes? to be done with as the Imperium chooses. Yes, did Lexandro's voice quiver. Immediately, with no turning back, no doubts, I came here, hoping. I bribed my way into a gang that I heard would be Recruiting for the guard, I, I believe you have shown a peculiarly passionate intensity. Yet, this is a very different proposition, sacredly so. The time for your vow is now. And though I may add that your family will be notified, and they will learn of your choice with pride, and the reflection of that pride may help protect them. In twenty years, perhaps thirty, you may return with tales to tell, though I cannot guarantee, for your heart will change wondrously. The giant was addressing Lexandro now as a man to potential man. Potential equal. I vow, Alexandro whispered. There you go. You can ponder where did that come from. And now, another excerpt. Hold on a second. Let me get to the beginning of it. Dun, 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 dun. Mountainous, or else multifold, as a swarm of locusts, or somehow both of these at once. Presently, astropathic signals from the outrider worlds in that easterly spiral arm of stars were quenched, though years might have passed until their absence was noted. Some astropaths who served the Inquisition tried to penetrate the nature of the shadow and died insane. They raved of cold, empty gulfs of timeless void that stretched out between the galaxies. Vacancies too vast for sanity. Nothing human could cross such an immensity. Yet, something had crossed, and had crossed the gulfs between other galaxies previously, inexorably. Those astropaths died, yet not before exonerating chaos of responsibility. The departments of several High Lords of Terror, Terra, were notified. The Adeptus Astrotelepathica, the Navis Nobilitae, 
the Chartist captains of the office of the Astronomicron, and the Adeptus Terra. Reports illuminated by scribes were sometimes pigeonholed. Gradually, awareness of a threat was gathering, though still whelmed in ignorance. The fortress monastery of the Imperial Fists was, and long had been, traversing Ultima Segmentum, describing a slow arc through those easterly marches, which would take almost forever to complete. Many more worlds had fallen silent. Ponderously, the Imperium had awoken to a creeping nightmare. Some understanding of the alien cause of this was retrieved by an otherwise disastrous expedition launched by the Blood Drinkers Marine Chapter into that now mute, umbrial zone of the fringe. Other marine companies had failed to return from forays, and one entire chapter, the Lamenters, seems to have vanished utterly. After years of planning, Imperial battleships were now gathering in the Ultima Segmentum. Marine chapters, whose names were almost legendary, were about to collaborate on a thrust into that shadow zone. The Space Wolves, the Blood Angels, the Ultramarines, the Blood Drinkers, and the Imperial Fists. During the coming crusade, the Fists might meet the same fate as the Lamenters, so that their fortress monastery might fly onward, eventually empty of battle brothers, bereft of command guidance, and a castrated abode of servitors and cyborgs who would continue the rituals of maintenance in the lost monastery for millennia or more, robotically, senselessly, alone in their corridor world of deserted firing ranges, forbidden chapels, taboo laboratories, where dust would gather throughout the aimless millennia, if the fists failed. In a speech from the balcony of the departure bay, Lord Commander Pogue had impressed on his fists that the Space Wolves, Ultramarines, Blood Angels were all valiant, dedicated chapters, but that fists were preeminently planners, as well as fighters, thinkers, wise warriors. What the Imperium itself, awakening to an impending new calamity, needed now, above all else, was knowledge of the nature of this creeping threat, of the substance that cast the terrifying shadow a substance which seemed intent on devouring the entire southeast spiral arm. Perhaps in a few centuries, or millennia, and then, perhaps all of the human galaxy, within a few ten or hundreds of eons. We're ramming through its arse! Indeed, as were the other fist-packed torpedoes aimed at other orifices where the alien hull might prove vulnerable. A sun shone distantly, biliously illuminating the outermost methane gas giant of this solar system. The planet of churning poisonous cyclones hundreds of miles deep segueing into the 
pressurized liquid manure within. It was a vertigrous crescent, cupping gaseous darkness. A pallid sickle moon attended to it. Known to the Guild of Navigators as Lacrima Dolorosa, the sun seemed, from certain perspectives, to be a teardrop dangling from an eye-shaped constellation. Beyond Lacrima Dolorosa, the star field thinned, its diamantine latest veils torn into rifts, revealing the ultimate night of the extragalactic void, from where the blot in the warp had issued. The shadow of whole fleets of these molluscoid alien ships arriving in the sprawling, half-charted galaxy of man and of abhumans and unhumans and of an inhuman, unspeakable chaos after a voyage which must have measured millennia. Those ships, they suggested fossilized ancient creatures which might once have grazed the submarine abysses of giant worlds, sucking up whales as if the whales were minnows. Creatures which had petrified a hundred million years previous, yet nevertheless were still virulent, virulently active and alive, still ravenous. A thousand such ships, many of them even more gargantuan than the torpedo's own chosen target, were now drifting into the Lacrimen de la Rosa system. Yet, this thousand was perhaps only one percent of the swarm that summed up the substance that cast the shadow. What manner of creatures dwelt inside such convoluted, organic-seeming ships? Creatures which might still, perhaps, be slumbering for the most part. Hopefully, still slumbering, whilst the eerie fleet drifted past the outermost gas giant on a course inwards towards Lacrima della Rosa III, a world of feral human beings who had relapsed into barbarism at least 10,000 years previously according to some ancient administratum archives. Now, the legendary gods of those barbarians would wage war with monsters in their skies, unnoticed and distantly, to begin with, until in the end alien fiends might gorge themselves on that lush and savage world. Unless... The fists and ultras and angels and imperial battleships repelled this rolling invasion, which seemed unlikely. The natives of Lacrima della Rosa III were almost certainly doomed, an event which, in itself, was of no account, a fate that was inherently trivial. Except, of course, to the victims. The prize here wasn't a dispensable world of savages, but rather knowledge of those intruders from the deep dark, to the nature and purpose of which only scattered dire hints as yet existed. A coccyx of bleached bone jutted into space, bearing the sphincter at its tip, like a quartet of triangular 
hemorrhoids clutched within bands of livid muscle, where the heads of these scarlet protuberances touched a tiny hole still puffed acidic discharge. The nose of the torpedo impacted rupturingly in that metis, wrenching its tissue open, burrowing deeper convulsively with thrusts of its jets as the fists clung to stanchions. The torpedo rocked as a shaped charge on the nose cone erupted, blasting a passageway ahead. Swiftly, the spring-loaded cone itself pedaled open, becoming a fourfold hatch, pressing fiercely against the inner anal walls in the manner of a surgical dilator. Out! 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 This rectum of the alien ship curved rightward, a slosh with steaming colloquial fluids, banded with slowly pulsing purple peristolic sinew. The high shriek of escaping atmosphere had already diminished to a whistle as the injured anus cramped tighter, reflectively reflexively around the girth of the plasteel troop carrier which had penetrated it. The colon itself soon branched into multiple oozing tubes too small to enter, but the sidewall had been lacerated into thick grisly ribbons. Captain Halstrom and Lieutenant Von Ruter sliced at the mass of blast-dissected cartilage with their power swords, carving a crude, wide doorway that bled gluey, snottish threads. Beyond, a hooped oval chamber, leprously aglow with a skin of white algae and ankle-deep in glutinous, dank sludge. A trio of tall deltoid doors stood open upon ribbed corridors. Tubes looped along the one corridor like a glossy intestines strung on crutches of varnished bone. Swollen, varicose veins webbed the areas of tissue between the ribs. The curved jams of those doorways trembled, holding back a pulsing curtain of puckered flesh. Each door was some kind of mindless slave creature, anchored by tentacles, whose only role was to open and shut. As more marines crowded into the chamber, Yeri was thrust forward. A door and poked one of the several softly glowing green nodules in its muscular rim with the barrel of his bolt gun, prying experimentally, as an x -tech well might. The stiff, fleshy curtain reflexed with a sigh, shutting itself tight, but for a long, dimpled crack. We're being shut in! exclaimed someone. No, Yuri probed again. The door dilated open once more. Pressure of the blast must have activated the doors. It's got all of those buttons to push at different heights, Biff observed. There must be critters of lots of different sizes on board, and the tallest must be at least twice the height of a man. Lex rubbed the condensation from the outside of his visor. The air was so humid. However, a silver icon of nostrils winked upon his field of vision. 
so the atmosphere was breathable enough. Captain Hellstrom was calling for the two Space Marine scout squads to vacate the torpedo and join their armored seniors, further packing the chamber. They, of course, wore no helmets and swore at the full impact of the fetid odors of which the marine suits merely brought a diagnostic whiff to the wearer's olfactory lobes. The alien ship wheezed and rumbled, droned and gurgled from afar off, nearby. Who could tell? Vibrations propagated through the flesh and bone. Echoes haunted the corridor. Sorry, going up a little more. So, anybody guess what this is yet? Who is this the <clears throat> first appearance of? I think it just goes on like that with the description. <laughs> Jointed arches which rib the walls flexed occasionally. Sometimes a questing tentacle wavered out from a hole in the bone, vents side gases, adding an omnic, uh, omnicial reek to the hot, wet cocktail of sweaty vapors, tart pheromones, sour xeno hormones, mildew, spice of attar, and a perversive odor of not quite nutmeg. Oh, for Lord Vladimir Pug's inability to save her. This whole ship seems biological, Von Ruder was saying, as he cut down one such tentacle. The appendage flopped about and grew hexagonal ruby eyes on stocks. Snake-like, it tried to slither away into the perilent yellow depression. The lieutenant sliced it up with his sword. So, I'd say we'll find controlling organs somewhere deep within it, like a heart and kidneys. Organs? Deep? The passageway branched. The saturated sponge continued for only a few meters along the left fork before withering into a Scaphrolis mat, where carmine slugs were grazing. Clusters of polyps were melted glutinously down the walls, releasing larvae which wriggled into vents. The tunnel was shedding its lining, revealing rigidly cartilage plates of gray grizzle. Across the base of the rightward passage were swelled a large pink cyst. It was suggestive of some giant mutant female ape's, ape's bum presented for fertilization. A low labial crater wall surrounded a semblance of a mouth with Floppy lips pressed shut. The cyst was two meters across. Marine Dolph Harlan was the first to try to cross the obstacle. He shut his visor before treading tentatively upon the side of the cyst prior to leaping. The surface was slimy. This would not have mattered except for that just then a larger relative to the patching bats came flapping at Harlan. It wrapped hook wings around his helmet. As Harlan tore it loose, he took an inadvertent step forward. He began to slip. The, si the cyst pulsed and dilated. Harlan fell in into its open lips. Fell? He almost seemed pulled. So swiftly did he disappear through the floor, the lips clamped shut again. Von Ruder radioed to Harlan in vain. In vain, 
he consulted the disposition readout on his faceplate. Dolph Harlan had vanished utterly from anywhere in the vicinity. Either he was disintegrated immediately, said Sergeant Uren, or else he traveled elsewhere, double quick. In which case, lower the sensor down, the lieutenant ordered. The ruin painted sensor dangled on a fine, strong chain, like a thurum bowl for burning incense into incense to Rogel Dorn. Chain ran through Urin's gauntlet as sensor then tether were sucked down into the inner labia of the cyst. Fiercely, till almost all of the chain had played out. When Jurgen Urin clinched his power fist and pulled, he drew up only a meter's length of the tether. The rest and the sensor had disappeared. Severed. Yuran and the lieutenant consulted the small veneered telemetry screen clipped to the sergeant's arms. Warp echo here, sir. This thing's a teleporter. There's no sign of reality re-entry. Sensor must still be in the warp. Sensor must still be in the warp. Harlan, too? Where's the sense in a teleporter that doesn't take you to any real destination? Garbage disposal? This thing's bigger than human size. Got to be for transport. No controls for coordinates, though. Maybe perhaps where you stand on the rim. Maybe you stamp out a signal. Harlan could be right at the heart of the vessel by now. Yes, the cyst was an organic teleporter through warp space. But to where? How's that? Yes, I'm reading that. Yes, that was a little long, but I actually liked it. So I thought you might think, what am I reading from? What could it Here's another good one. The Leviathan that loomed ahead seemed a cross between a nautilus and an omnivorous spacefaring snail. It was the length of a 4K asteroid, and almost as high where its shell spiraled upwards in a circuit of increasingly small, osseous chambers. The shell was bleached chalky by eons of radiation. Even as the armored fists, tightly packed into a stretched boarding torpedo, stared at the forward view screen in its mount of bronze bones, that sphincter pulsed. It expelled a quick, milky cloud, which the torpedo sensors assayed as consisting of bitter liquid dregs, foul gas, and ashy debris. The fart of a leviathan. <laughs> okay, 33 minutes. That, my friend, is my homage to the 30th anniversary of 40k. I'll let you think about it. And maybe I'll even read more later. We shall find out. But until next time, bye.